Our second scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. This is towards the end of his letter as he begins to wrap everything up. And uh, his, the letter in Ephesians has a whole lot of um, things that really matter in that horizontal arena of life. It has a whole lot of relationship and, and how to conduct yourself in a church congregation so that everyone is respected and everyone feels loved. This is a, a church that was asking Paul for lots of advice in that arena. You know, how to do things right, how to really make our, our faith manifest in our relationships with others. That's a lot of what Ephesians deals with. It's a great book with a lot of useful tools uh, in it. And so here in chapter 6, as he wraps things up, these are his words to the church in Ephesus and to us this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Building a strong relationship with God, sometimes we just need to know a place to start. We feel like it's kind of tough to just start somewhere and develop that habit. And scientists tell us that it takes about 21 times of doing something before it really becomes a habit. And it only takes, I think, five or six times of not practicing that habit to break it. And so when we're doing spiritual practices, when we're trying to approach our Bibles and read our Bibles anew or pray, you know, sometimes we, we develop this feeling of insecurity. That's actually one of those uh, tricks and wiles of the devil that, um, that Paul was talking about. And, and we feel all of a sudden like, you know, why am I doing this? This is crazy. I don't know how to do this. What if I do it wrong? Do I get struck by a bolt of lightning? You know, it, it can be kind of tough just to start. But that often is the best place. Just to start with an open heart to God. Yesterday, some of us uh, went to a, a training event at, first, uh, at Ocala First Methodist. Uh, and it was on this thing that, that the district is emphasizing and that uh, we've been doing a little bit of. It's not a church growth strategy. It's not a, uh, a crazy thing, really. It's just, uh, it's called Fresh Expressions. And it's about uh, really teaching us uh, and, and helping us learn from each other how to uh, rethink the way that we approach doing church. That church is not about really, and, and in our new kind of, the way the world is now, uh, we have to move away from being an attractional church where we try to constantly attract people to us to being a church that takes the word of God, that takes the message of Christ out to the world around us. That's really the key thing with a fresh expression. It, it's a way of taking church from the steeple to the streets. And that's when things get scary again. Right? Scary enough to have your own spiritual life and really begin to develop it. But it can be really scary as we take our own faith out to others. We all, somewhere in our, in, in our psyche, probably have some fear of rejection or some fear of speaking out or some fear that will be ridiculed. And so we need those things Paul talks about in the scripture passages we read today. We need that whole armor of God so that we can stand and, and be the presence of Christ in a world that either doesn't know about it um, or is completely alien to it or is outright hostile to it or has heard a very different Christ. 
And so it, it can be really tough as we stand there and say, okay, we're going to go out and meet our neighborhood and, and, and talk to people that live around us and, and tell them about Christ or maybe start a little Bible study or a, 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 a something that really begins to show people the love of Christ. That can be tough. But every single one of us has been given a call to do just that. So we're going to need that armor of God. We're going to need spiritual preparation. We're going to need to have a regular and, and, and habitual prayer life, a regular and habitual way of reading our Bible, a regular and habitual um, time when we gather together with other Christians and, and renew ourselves and, and sing a little bit and celebrate God. And so those Christian practices help us in that. So as Paul goes on in, in, in his letter, he is writing some of those last words to the Ephesians. And he's telling them about where, how they need to prepare themselves, how to really and truly, uh, we would call it, wear their Sunday best all week long. How do they work? How do they, they live as a Christian in a world that in their day was outright hostile to the gospel, that misunderstood the Christian message, that, that pretended that it was subversive and they were you know, practically enemies of the state in many areas because they proclaimed that Jesus was Lord and not Caesar. A bad thing to say in the Roman Empire. And so as, as Paul shares what they need to prepare in, 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 um, in Ephesians, he also is mentioning that same thing to the Colossian church as we read about in our scripture today. What he talks about to the Colossians really is goes along with the Ephesians words that he shares. And to the Colossians, he tells them that there are several things he, he's praying for them for that they would develop in their own spiritual life and that they would grow in. And he prays for the church to grow in knowledge. He doesn't want them to be people that simply feel their faith and then go no further. He wants them to have thought and intellectually digested their faith and really have it something that they ponder and they pray about and they read and they study. Also, he wants people who are obedient. He's praying for obedience, that they would obey Christ. And part of obedience is trust. He's asking them, look, obey what God is calling you. Do what God is asking you to do. It sounds weird. It feels weird. It's scary. But it's where God wants you to be. And he's also praying that people would have this sense of spiritual power around them. This really flows out of this knowledge of God, this knowledge of our faith, and also this obedience to God. He also wants, he's praying that these Colossians are people who see God's spirit at work in the world and see the spiritual aspects of their faith at work continually. Who feel in this spiritual sense that God is right there next to them. And so going on into Ephesians, as, as Paul's then writing to the Ephesians church, he's reminding them about putting on this armor of God. Now, we as Christians don't really need to be, I don't think, you know, defensive and, and worried about being attacked all the time. Um, but what we need to be is we need to realize kind of how we need to um, prepare ourselves for that call in the world. How we, God has given us permission to go out and tell the world about the gospel of Christ, to go out and show people love and show people God's presence is with them. And so he tells the early Ephesian Christians that there are some things they need to know. The first thing he, he delineates for them is he reminds them who their enemy really is. That's pretty important for us. Sometimes we can get a little confused. Sometimes we disagree with someone and we think that they're being hostile to us and we feel attacked and we start to defend ourselves against that supposed enemy. But Paul reminds them, and this is in the face of a world that was really hostile to them. He says, we do not fight against enemies of flesh and blood. 
Even though it was the flesh and blood Romans that were attacking them, the flesh and blood magistrates and court officials that were after them, that wanted to catch them at worship because it was a fun thing to do to, to, to torment a Christian. Even though it was the Romans who were cheering for them as they were tore apart by lions and they were forced into gladiatorial contests to see how far their pacifism would really go. Even so, Paul is telling them, no person is your enemy. So let's say it together. No person is my enemy. We do not fight against flesh and blood, Paul tells us. But what we're fighting about is the stuff behind and around the flesh and blood. Those spiritual forces of wickedness and spiritual forces of darkness. That's really what our enemy is. It's the sin and, and the th way that, that things get twisted and the evil in the world. That's what our fight is against. It's not the people that are doing the evil acts. And so we need to be prepared for a battle. Paul gives us an image of a fully clad Roman soldier. Which was kind of ironic considering these were the people attacking them. But he gives us the image of this fully clad Roman soldier. And um, if you remember or if you've ever seen uh, you know, some movies that have these, this first century armor on or this, even the ancient Greeks sort of uh, approached it. But the Romans had some special sort of technological advances that really made them so militarily powerful. And they come into, they come into play here as Paul is doing his analogy. First of all, we'll need truth. Like a belt around our waist, he says. And some translations render this, you know, gird your loins with truth. The belt is what keeps all the stuff together. If you don't have a belt, you just have a flowing gown like this. This isn't a good suit of armor. But a belt all of a sudden helps with keeping everything together. And so does truth in our lives. The ability to know what is true and what is not true is very important in the life of a Christian. The ability to know what is truth and what is not truth will help make all the difference. It will help keep our, our hearts and our minds together as we say, wait a second, no, this is what God's will is and this is what God's will is not. If we know the truth, it will indeed set us free. He also mentions righteousness, like a breastplate. Righteousness is what guards our heart. It's what, it's what creates a sense of peace. And in the Roman days, it was not a full, you know, we, we're, not look, we're not talking about medieval knights, but they did have a, a chest plate right over their bodies that protected their hearts and their internal organs. And it was that, that sense of, of power that you could stand there and know that the biggest part of you that was the easiest target, your heart, spiritually and physically, would be protected. He also mentions shoes. Now these could have been the kind of hobnail boots that the Romans wore. Uh, this could have been a lot of other things, but he actually gives us some flexibility here. He says, take whatever you need so you can proclaim the gospel of peace. Now shoes are not a military weapon. You don't, you don't attack or defend yourself with your shoes, but shoes help you go. They help you not get your feet injured. They do defend a little bit. But he says, take whatever you need so you can proclaim the gospel of peace. So this is not simply a standing still. This is a well-planted sort of standing so that we know that God's got us and that we are stable in our faith and in God's love. The next thing he mentioned is faith and trust. This is probably my favorite image. Um, the faith and trust that he mentions is like a shield. And the word that he uses, the, this word for shield, he wasn't using the, the shield as that small little round shield that was kind of more mobile. The word that he's using is the word that described what really made the Romans so different from the rest of the world. It was that shield that you see sometimes still in, in riot police where it's this full body shield. And the way you advance is simply to move forward. 
And you create this human wall. Now, the greatest threat to that, though, is these flaming arrows that Paul's talking about. You know, you're standing there in the truth and and you're, you're trusting and you have your shield out. And then there's all these arrows flying around and they can get behind the shield. So the Romans had a special use for their big shields. And it involved being together. If you, were, if you were alone all by yourself, that big, huge shield was actually not an asset. It was a bad thing to have. But when you were together with others, it made all the difference. Because not only could you plant your shield in front of you to protect yourself and your, fo- your mates behind you, but the Romans also used to gather the shields up and they would lay them on top of each other. So you had a wall going forward and then you had the wall going back and no archer's arrows could hardly even get to it. You could put those shields up high and they would almost build this wall to, to, that was impenetrable by these flaming arrows that they would face as they went around the world and conquered other people. So this is not just a, a kind of faith and a kind of trust all in ourselves. It's a faith and a trust that that friend next to you is just as important as you are. And that you are just as important to the whole health of the whole unit or the whole church as anyone else is. Because I guarantee you, there, were, there was nobody standing there who didn't think that their shield needed to hold up for their own safety and for the safety of others. Just as in a church, no one is more important. We all have a special call. Whether you're a pastor who has a certain special call or whether you're a layperson who has a certain special call, none of us is any more or less important than the other. Just like that wall that those Romans had because of their faith and their trust in their brother. Paul is encouraging these Christians to have that same kind of faith and same kind of trust. Continuing on in in his list here, we see Paul talking about a sword. Now, this is often misunderstood, actually. The sword, sometimes we think, oh my gosh, now they've got an offensive weapon. But the sword, actually, in this passage, the word that he uses for the sword is, this, is the small kind of, it's, it's a really more of a dagger. It's not, we're not talking about a long, broad sword, but more of a dagger that the Romans used for close combat. And this this dagger and this shield was not only an offensive weapon, but it was also defense. It allowed them to move around better. They could parry a thrust from someone else and move around and have their shield there. It also could poke out of the little cracks between the shields. It was a very active weapon, and it was not the size of the sword that mattered, really. It was more of the team that was using it all at once, all together, The Romans were incredibly disciplined. They were incredibly just together. They knew all the moves together. They they moved together. And they knew what they were doing. And they knew their purpose. And they knew their call. But this sword of the Spirit that he's talking about, what he tells us is the Word of God, but he does not mean the Bible. Keep in mind, 1st century, 2nd century, really until the 15th century, Christians did not have a, a personal Bible in their homes. So when he talks about carrying the word of God with you, he's not talking about carrying your Bible. He's talking about carrying the story with you. Carry the word of God he's talking about as you look at the context and how he means it. He means carry the gospel with you. That is that sword that can cut through the mess around you. That's what gives you the piercing truth you need. To tell people about God's love. Don't worry about having your own words. Don't worry about about what am I going to say? What am I going to do? What if I get asked a question? What happens? The best weapon we can have against that kind of self-doubt and that kind of worry is this sword of the word of God. Because when we know the story, when we know about God's love, and we know about the things that Jesus did, we don't have to worry about getting the story exactly right. What we have to know is about how to transmit God's love through that story. Maybe we are outside spreading God's love and and we're volunteering as a chaplain in a NICU ward or for a mother who's just had a baby. 
Maybe we feel God calling our hearts to, to talk about that precious birth in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And we might share our own story or share that story with someone. We don't have to worry about getting all the details right. It's the story that matters. Whether we say Quirinius or Quirinius, it doesn't matter. What's important is that we tell them about God's love through that story. Maybe we have someone going through total rejection and feeling completely hit, beat upon and feeling bullied and feeling terrible. And we can talk to them about, hey, you know, you probably feel like a complete outcast. But let me tell you about what Jesus did, does with outcasts. Let me tell you about the lepers and the tax collectors that he healed. And we don't have to open our Bibles and say, okay, turn to this page. What we do is we transmit the story Transmit God's love. Tell them about what happened. Tell them about the difference that it made in their lives and the difference that it's made in your life. Now, we have to know our scriptures a little bit. We have to know the general story. But it's more about where our heart is that counts. If we know that Jesus had compassion for the poor and we know that Jesus had compassion for the outcasts and we know that Jesus did challenge the powerful and he made sure that God's love was primary and foremost and first, that's the story. If we forget a detail that's in the Bible here and there, God understands. The important thing is we remind people about God's love when we're out there in the community. There's a, a great thing that goes on out of Wildwood UMC. Um, and, and a good friend of mine, and actually he worked here for a summer, Michael Beck, um, has this thing he calls burritos and Bibles. Started with a relationship with the, um, the, the owner of this Moe's in Wildwood. I don't even know where exactly the Moe's is, but down there in Wildwood, the village's area. And he just started a Bible study in this Moe's. And people walk in, people walk out, people are, are coming in line and they see this whole group of people studying their Bibles. And, you know, sometimes they, they're interested and they want to know more. Sometimes they, they scoff a little bit. But always they see Christian life being practiced there in that setting. Some people have never been exposed to that. Some people have never really seen that kind of practice happening. Maybe they overhear some things. Maybe they, they go, oh, wow, these, these guys are talking about stuff I didn't know Christians talked about. But they take that church and they take God's love and they move it out of the church walls. Mike also, uh, his church, and this is not just Mike doing these things because the important thing about Fresh Expressions is it, the pastor is not in charge. The pastor is is not in charge. I hear nobody saying amen, but it's okay if you're, you're feeling it in your heart. <laughs> Pam's like, say it again, say it again. <laughs> it, it, it's not about any idea I have. And I give you permission. You want to start a Bible study? And, and Mike has, Mike's church, excuse me, Mike's church has done this. They have a, a Bible study in a tattoo parlor. People are getting inked while they're studying the Bible. Yes, it's possible. And so, all of these crazy things that maybe, you know, maybe you have a particular vision, something that you've thought, now oh, that's too crazy to try. I give you permission to try it. Put on that armor of God, prepare your heart and prepare your soul, but know that God has your back. Go with that crazy idea. I give you permission. I'm not in charge. God is in charge. God is in charge of everything we do. If there's some crazy vision, a crazy picture that you've had your whole life and you say, or, or your whole spiritual life and you think, God, that would be, that would be amazing, but uh, the pastor would never go for it. I give you permission to do that. If you'd like advice, resources, help, I'm here, I'm here to be a resource, but I'm not in charge. And that's the great thing about these fresh expressions. Mike, Michael Beck did not start any of these things. He empowered people to go and do them. He was involved in them in some way, yes, but he did not issue directives and say, hey, y'all go do this. Hey, y'all go start this. And that's the great thing. 
Because it's not the pastors of the church that really make the difference. It's the people of the church that do. It's all of us standing together just like those Roman soldiers. United in purpose, united in love, united in will, and united in trust. Keep in mind, those shields represent us extending an arm. It takes trust. We're not hiding behind things, we're extending an arm. And so the shield of faith is important. That's what helps us. That faith and that trust in God helps us extend our arm. And as we tell people about the message, when we use our sword, that means we open up. To use your sword, you have to move your shield aside. Every soldier probably feared that part of the battle just as much as Many of us, and I know just as well as you, fear that opening up to others about our faith. Keep in mind, I grew up Episcopalian. Evangelism is a four-letter word to us. But the one thing, and I'm just telling you my story, the one thing that told me to take the step to be a pastor, to take the step to be outward in my faith, was God simply telling me, look, if you trust me, I'll give you what it takes to do it. And that's the word that I heard from God, and that's the word I, I issue to any of you out there. God will give you what it takes to do it. And we'll bumble our way through it. We'll make some mistakes. God will go, no, that's not what I meant. But then we'll correct ourselves and learn from it. That's all right. That's why there's grace. But part of what I hope you've heard in this sermon series is that sense of, yes, there is preparation that we need spiritual practices, and a, and a real dedication to forming those habits. You heard Beth say, there's some funny things that we can do as mnemonic devices to help ourselves remember. I had not thought about putting my shoes under the bed uh, like that, but that's actually a pretty good idea. I'd go, where are my shoes? Oh, they're under, I can never find my shoes. Where am I, you know, there's, they're right there. Whatever it takes, even if it is a little crazy, so that we remember to have God out there first thing in the morning, in the middle of the day, and the last thing at night. And then this is the last verse that Paul tells us in Ephesians. He says, pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. He says supplication twice in those verses. Be people of prayer. Even if you feel like you're not getting anywhere with your prayer, keep doing it. Keep trying. Keep opening yourself up to God's love. And that happens when we open our hearts and we say, Lord, what are you doing? I don't get it. Or God, thank you. Or Lord, give me this day my daily bread. It doesn't matter. that Prayer is not a a form. There are no gourmet prayers. It just is what it is in your heart and in your life. So I would encourage you and I give you permission to put on that armor, to go out, get to know our neighbors, and I want you to save a date. Don't have all the details yet. They mentioned this in our training yesterday and I heard about it a little bit before at some meetings the district I went to. April the 8th. It's the day before Palm Sunday, and it is a day that they're calling 13,628 going. And you may think, huh, that's a weird number. That is, based on average worship attendance, that's the number of United Methodists there are in the North Central District, from Alachua to Tavares, from uh, Melrose down to Floral City and Lake Panasofsky. That's the North Central District of this conference. And there are 13,628 Methodists there. If we all got out at once and got out to get to know our neighborhood in some way, and this is kind of an open format, you know, the thought is, what kind of difference could we make? Not just for our churches, we certainly want to reach out and grow with people that are here, but also just for the kingdom, just for God. We go people and engage people and pray with people and talk. And the format's not really, we don't know what form we're going to take on it. But 
The idea is to get the average worship attendance of your church, and in this church it's about 165, to get the average worship attendance out there engaging with the community. And so we'll be getting more details of that, but mark your calendars for April the 8th. That's the day before Palm Sunday. Um, And I think it will be a great thing. And it's going to be a little scary. But God gives us what we need to do it. And so I hope that you'll join uh, with me. But not just join. I give you permission to do it. Let us pray. Lord, you remind us through your servant Paul that we are to grow in knowledge and obedience and we are to grow in that spiritual power that can only come as we put on the armor of God. But that armor is not for a violent combat, but rather so that your love reaches beyond the attacks and that your love reaches through the flaming arrows of the devil and can withstand any tricks that he tries to pull on us. Lord, we ask for that protection. Help us every day as we're getting dressed to put on that Sunday best, the armor of God. Help us to tie our, our, around our waist with truth. Help us to stand firm and, and, and remember about that breastplate of righteousness. Help us behave right and behave with your love and remember that that often does protect our heart so that you can be beat stronger in our chest than anything else. Help us to strap on good shoes so that we might go out and spread the good word and the message of your love. Help us to grab our shields that are not meant just for us, but for protection of the whole community. Help us to reach our hands out and trust that you will still be there to protect us. Give us a sword that is your message of love. Give us a sword that cuts through all the junk and the darkness and the evil around us and pierces it with your love and your clear and and revolutionary message of salvation to all who would come. Help us remember that our enemies are not the flesh and people blood that we the flesh and blood people that we face every day. But that those are the people you love. Help us fight instead against those spiritual forces of darkness and hatred and evil and violence in our world. So that we may truly build your kingdom not just in our hearts, but out there in the world around us. For you so loved that world that you gave your only begotten Son for it, so it might be saved. Amen.